Hi, I'm Jeff Farnwald, director of the MBA program at Rockford University. About 18 months ago, the Rockford Chamber of Commerce set out to make networking easier in Rockford by identifying area people you should know in business. Currently, 41 people have been recognized and celebrated as one of these people. This series of talks held at Rockford University was designed to provide a vehicle for the public to hear from and learn about each of the people you should know. I hope you enjoy this talk. Hi, come on in. I am Assistant Director of Programs um, for Rockford University, and I, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Tom Muldowney. Tom is the Chairman of the Board, a Principal, and a Financial Advisor for Savant. He has been involved in the banking, investment, insurance, and financial services industry since 1975. Tom has taught consumer education courses at Rock Valley and Sauk Valley Community Colleges. He has served as a contributing author for the Law Portfolio ser Series, published by the Law and Business Division of Walters and Kluwer through Aspen Publishers. Tom's topics included financial planning for the elderly and post-mortem post -mortem estates planning. Tom earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Rockford University, then Rockford College, yes. and a Master's in Financial Services from the American College. He is a Chartered Life Underwriter, Chartered Financial Consultant, Certified Retirement Counselor, Certified Medical Planner, Accredited Investment Fiduciary, and a Certified... <laughs> ...active member of many organizations, including the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, the Financial Planning Association, and the Society of Financial Service Professionals. From 2004 to 2008, Tom represented Savant on Medical Economies Magazine's list of top 150 best financial advisors for doctors. He is a former mem member of the TD Ameritrade Advisory Panel and the Association of Fundraising Professionals. The local, national, and industry media frequently speak out and quote him. Tom is currently trustees for Rockford University. A lifelong Catholic, Tom is a member of Equestrian Order of the Holy Specular of Jerusalem and has been awarded the Order of St. Gregory by the Secretary of State of Vatican City through the aegis of His Excellency, Bishop Thomas G. Doran. In 2010, Tom was honored with the Spirit of Caring Award by Crusader Community Health serves as a mentor to Savant, Savant, I'm so sorry for butchering that, financial advisors. Tom is married to Rosemary and has four adult children and six grandchildren. He enjoys bicycling, working on his farm, and creative writing, including, including writing poetry. Yes. Very impressive. Please help me welcome Tom. Thank you, Michelle. My mom could have written that, but she would have gone on just a little bit longer. <laughs> And uh, the de professional designations that Michelle was reading, all it really says is that I won't be arrested for impersonating a financial advisor. So uh, you got a string of initials, and that was just a function of the stuff that you, you learn when you're growing up in any professional business. Um, before I launch, one of the questions that I would like to throw out to you is a very, very simple question, but it's going to really kind of make you think a little bit if you answer me. And the question is, if this were to be the very best of all the discussions that you had through all of the PYSK people, what has to happen? What do you need to hear today in order to say, wow, that was the sort of thing that I needed to hear. It's very important for me. So go ahead and take a stab at that. Anybody? What do you want? What, what would make this a success for you? Learning your passion. Okay, uh, Jeff says learning my passion. Ryan? One thing I can take away from it that I didn't know before. One thing that you can take away from it that you didn't know before, okay? And let's do those both, passion and one new thing. Your time management. My time management? There is none, so I won't. <laughs> Um, yeah, wh wh one of the things that I've sadly found is that it is impossible to manage time. It just keeps coming. 
So uh, your job then becomes one of saying what is the, either if you're very organized, and those of you that know me well know I'm not organized, not even am I close to being organized, uh, but what happens is, uh, and let's see if I can give a good description, and I don't have it here, sadly, I didn't bring it, but I wrote a poem on the difference between filers and pilers. There's two types of people in the world. <laughs> Okay, and, and you already know them. There, there's two types of people. Filers are people who say, for every piece of paper that I have, I'm going to take it, put a label on it, and stick it in a file. And the pilers just take everything and they put it on a stack, and that stack just keeps getting higher and higher and higher and higher. And if you ever go to a, a piler and you say, where is the Johnson and Abercrombie file? He's going to say in the stack, it's about right here. Okay, and if you go to a filer, uh, the filer will tell you, I filed it, but we really haven't done much on retrieval. So, <laughs> ultimately, the thing that you're looking for in filing and piling is, can I get my hands on something like that? And I am a piler. I'm a guy who makes a stack, and I can tell you pretty much where everything is along the way. So, in terms of the, the aspect of time management, um, I've actually relinquished that to other people. So, what they do is they set up my time schedule. And it makes it real easy for me. I just go from place to place to place. So, but, but if I can give you more about that as I go along or as I make it up, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay? Anything else that you want to hear today? Okay, I'm a Rockford College kid. And uh, probably Dr. Head would come along and snap me on the ear and say, no, we're Rockford University. But I was here a long, long time ago. And I came here for a most unusual reason. My brothers came here. Okay, and to be candid, that was a good enough reason for me because when I was a children and growing up, I grew up not really thinking about where am I going to go to school or am I going to, pardon me, I'm not, not a, am I going to go to school. The only question I really had to answer is where am I going to go to school? And it was good for my brothers. It was a very good experience and I figured, hey, that'll work for me. So came to Rockford College. I did something a little bit unusual as did my other brothers. We figured, finished in four years. Uh, you guys have, you guys have probably read about that in the history books. Um, the whole idea there, though, was uh, this was not uh, a free line. I got to tell you, I graduated in 1974, and in 74 I came out of school with school debt that was $625. Okay, so those of you that are looking at college debt, um, it's always a challenge for people who are coming out of school with college debt because they keep seeing the, seeing the numbers grow absolutely larger. And one of the questions that we get all the time, and Ryan, do they know you work with me? Do we work together at, at uh, Savant? One of the questions that we're constantly asked is, what do I do with that college debt? You know, should I hurry up and pay it off, or what should I do? And, and my typical answer is that college debt is capital formation. So it goes right into the context of the financial world. And capital, college debt and capital formation is the most expensive type of capital debt that you can accumulate, and it's also the longest paying because it will pay you for the rest of your life. And because it will pay you for the rest of your life, there, I would typically say there's not an urgency to run out and pay it off. Consequently, I would suggest that you amortize it. Tell you a little bit, about, uh, a little bit more about me. I'm a Rockford kid. And those of you that have had the opportunity to hear me speak in the past, I defend Rockford. Sometimes it really needs defending. Um, but I'm a Saint Ed I went to school at St. Ed's, which is way over on the southeast end of town. I went to Boylan High School. I uh, went to Rockford University, Rockford College. I went out east to get my uh, graduate degree. And uh, when Dr. Head invited me to be on the board, he also indicated that they'd do kind of a senior seminar, and they would bring the seniors in and let the seniors grill uh, the alum. And one of, the young, one of the youngsters came up and said, well, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. So I said, well, St. Ed's, Boylan, Rockford College, when I used to get my graduate degree, and then when I came back here, I started my own business. And a kid looked at me and he said, you know, you really haven't gotten very far. <laughs> so, um, now, I, I thought it was pretty clever. Um, and in fact, I did. I mean, I took it with a grain of salt. And for those of you that either don't know or don't care, Savant has been very much blessed. Uh, as far as independent financial advisors, we're about the 10th or 12th or 15th or whatever it is, depending on who measures and on what day, uh, which is kind of unique for something like that that we would see coming out of Rockford. Okay, and people, when you, when you read various publications about Rockford, they're very down on Rockford. But Rockford has a really, really great background, a really great history. I'm very proud of it, and I'm happy to defend it. So uh, from that standpoint, um, 
one of the things that happened when I was at school here, my uh, undergrad was in biology. And a lot of people said, well, how did you go from biology to get into the finance world? And the answer was, at the time, I thought I wanted to get into medicine. And two things frustrated that. One of them was my grades, okay, which were, which were not stellar. If we go back to the 1970s, appreciate what had to happen is you really had to be pressing up against the top of the grades there. I was a townie, so I lived in town. Rosemary and I were married between sophomore and junior year, and I spent working so that when I graduated from school, I only had $625 of college debt, uh, which was a giant amount, certainly, at that particular time. Um, went and followed a couple physicians around, and when I followed the physicians around, I found I got sick every time they opened up a body or looked and pulled out <laughs> stitches, and uh, they really were offended by people puking while they're, <laughs> while they're trying to work. Uh, so a couple of them just looked and he said, are you sure this is the sort of thing you should be looking at? And uh, it was pretty clear that that was not the sort of thing that I should be specifically looking at. It, it truly did. It made, made me, I mean, it was, it was uh, very uh, honorously sick. And if you've ever been in an environment where somebody gets really sick, it has a tendency to be infectious. So, <laughs> so, so uh, it's something you got to be careful with. Um, I'm kind of a little bit of a different from the financial guy. So those of you guys that are in the financial field, um, if you look at it, if you look at it, uh, look at Wall Street. Wall, Wall Street is a very data-driven enterprise. Uh, they measure, they stack, they count, they do statistics, and they line all of these pieces up, and they can do all kinds of evaluation that I can't do. Okay, and I got to tell you, I'm I'm even happy that I can't do it, and I'm happy on two counts: one that I don't have to. But number two, there are other people that really like it. Okay, and if they really like it, they're very energized. But because of that, I've kind of morphed into a philosopher. And when I talk about the philosophy of money, it really changes things. Because instead of saying, what's the best investment, or how can I reach my financial goals, or how, how much insurance should I buy, or some other variation, I keep coming back and I ask a very, very simple question. What's the point? Why are you doing this? What, if, if, if you want to have something that you can come back and say, this was really good, you want to answer that question. What's the point of all of this? Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about money in that regard. Um, the unique part about being in the financial business is this. Everybody on the planet works for money. There are virtually no exceptions. There are a handful of people that are totally altruistically driven. But for the majority of us, we work for money. And then we have to come back and ask the question, what's the point? And the point is a very simple point. Humans are the only animal on the planet that outlive their economic resourcefulness. Every other animal on the planet, when they lose their economic resourcefulness, gets eaten. <laughs> Okay. Now, humans are also kind of unique in another regard, and the other regard is humans are the only animal on the planet that can store their excess labor. Humans work more than they need to sustain themselves. So what they do is they take that excess and they either store it, there's a handful of people, actually there's a lot of people that blow it with all that excess labor. In other words, they're using it rather than for uh, to meet their long-term objectives so they don't get eaten when they run out of their resourcefulness. You know, it's movies. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I don't want to suggest movies are bad. I want to suggest that sometimes there's a lack of discretion on all the things that they use. Those are called consumer products. They, they use assets to buy consumer products. And one of the unique features that I've discovered about uh, consumer products is that they are often flushed. So consequently, when you're, pardon me, when you're looking at consumerism, that stuff usually goes away, and you have nothing to show for it. So if humans are the only animal on the planet that can work harder than they need in order to, uh, to, to live, they're able to take their excess labor and store it. They store it in the form of wealth. And then when they take that wealth, they propel it out into the future to a time when they will run out of their economic resourcefulness. And when they run out of their economic resourcefulness, they can reach into that pot of wealth and be able to pull the labor that they need out of it in order to buy food, shelter, clothing, lifestyle, and all the other things that they want. It's a very different approach to the world of finances when you look at it in the context of labor. 
And I gotta tell you, it's an extremely personal phenomenon. And the reason is, when you look at the money, we're less impressed. But when we look at it and say, wait a minute, that's not just a lifetime of work, because a lifetime of work is what I took to sustain myself. And now, all of this extra is another lifetime of work. And I need to be able to call on that lifetime of work uh, to sustain me uh, in, my, uh, in my retirement or however else I want to spend uh, the rest of my life. So uh, from a philosophy standpoint, uh, that makes a great deal of sense. And I've even wrestled, uh, for those of you that know or care, um, or don't care, my daughter works with me at Savant, and it's a real treat because Libby just finished her studies on CFP. She's also a Rockford University graduate. And uh, she came to me with a curious question about a, a set of folks that came in to visit with her. And she said, well, basically what they're doing is they're, uh, you know, they, they're kind of late starters. They just had their first child and they're trying to figure out what they need to do to get junior. And she said, what should I do? Don't tell them anything. Right. Now, I'll season for you. Most of the people, most of the people in the financial world would immediately turn to the books, and the books would say, use this type of IRA. It's a special thing designed for people who want to save for a college education. Use this 529 plan. Go to the state and get some sort of plan where you can start pre-funding the college expense. And she said, what, what are you telling them to do? And what I'm telling them, on average, is this it is virtually impossible for someone to pay for their college education today. And consequently, what mom and dad should do is take all of that extra labor that they have above and beyond what they need to sustain themselves and put it into their own retirement plan, their own 401k or pension or IRA or some variation thereof, and they can go ahead and continue to fund it all the way up until the time junior is age 18 and ready to enter school. So let's imagine that they've done that uh, successfully and they have themselves a uh, quarter million dollars over the course of 20 years or whatever the number would be and then you figure uh, those of you that are the math guys or the finance guys you know about the rule of 72 rule of 72 says at 10 percent the money will double every 7.2 years at 7.2 percent the money will double every 10 years so if they're 45 or so and juniors ready to go to school they got two 10-year periods, so their 250 turns into 500, their 500 turns into a million, and that doesn't count if they did putting, that doesn't assume that they put any money into it after the day that Junior started school. So they can spend, they can legitimately spend the next 20 years paying for Junior's school. And their self, their financial wherewithal, their financial capacity will be well satisfied. Now you've already run into this uh, if you've been on an airplane. After they start the engine, before they loft it up into the air, what they do is they everybody sit down, and if the oxygen mask drops out of the ceiling, what are you supposed to do? Put it on you first. And then after you put it on you, you can go and help all the other people in the cabin. But the most important part is for you to take care of yourself first. So that's the message that we're giving to the parents. That's a message that I want to relay to you. I want you to take it and own it. You should stuff as much money as you can into your own retirement plan. It's your money. And then at such time as your youngsters get to school, you're going to find you're going to be able to stop contributing and your retirement will still be solvent. Um, we live in a very curious world today. Now, I, we already figured out I can't write on here. OK. And, uh, Ryan works with me, so sadly Ryan already knows that I can't do anything without coloring, so that's really where this comes into play. Creation. That's when, you know, let the earth, you know, the water spread apart and the sunlight come down, fiat lux and all that. Technology curve. that. Now, I shouldn't have it curving back, but you get the drift. And what this is doing, this is telling us that technology has ex expanded phenomenally over the course of the last 50 years, but for the prior 5,000 years, it really didn't do too much. Exactly that same period of time, we get a curve that looks like that. Humans haven't changed in 5,000 years. Okay, so when you get out into the real world, you're going to have the opportunity to say, I'm going to be techie. I'm going to understand all of these new devices. And anybody that's working on the same device, the phone device or 
communication device that they had five years ago. It's probably pretty much outdated by now. Okay, but how much has changed regarding the human? Humans still want one thing. What they want in their life is peace of mind. So what's peace of mind? Take a stab at it, somebody, peace of mind. It's different for everybody, but I would say a, fi a secure financial future. Security, so we don't specifically have to say financial, but security, okay? I allege that peace of mind is freedom from worry. Okay, whatever that worry is, they want that, that worry to go away. So what I do is I spend my time down here answering the question, what's the point? Why are we doing this? What freedom do you want? And what they want is to be free from the tasks of having to worry one way or another. Uh, consequently, uh, uh, if, if you focus on that, uh, you're going to find that your career does very well. Now, I don't know the timing on this. You said 20 minutes. I don't know if we're, we're coming, up, coming up on it. You've got 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, all of you, I think, want to walk away today, even though you didn't articulate it when I gave you the chance. You all, you all want to walk away from here with something so that when you walk out of here, you can say, that's the best piece of advice that I ever got. Okay, and I want to give that to you, and I'm going to give it to you kind of spread out over a couple of different examples. Uh, Ryan, sadly, has already had the opportunity to hear this because I addressed my own company uh, a week ago or so. Uh, the, the one thing that you all have the opportunity to do is you are all empowered to help someone else. Okay, if you, in whatever it is that you do, whether you're in the technical world or you're down here working with the, the, the humans who are messy and clumsy and have all kinds of problems to deal with, if you help someone else, they will always remember it. And consequently, you'll be elevated by helping someone else. You personally will be elevated, but what happens is they get lifted at the same time that they're lifted, you get lifted. Now the key, the real ultimate key to having success in your environment, whatever it would be, is to help as many people as you can. If you help people, what will happen is other folks will accidentally bump into you. And it's not accidental. What will happen is they start talking about each other. I had a problem with this. I couldn't figure out my college. I couldn't figure out what I need to do with this or that. And what ha happens is someone says, well, you know, go and talk to Ryan Manette. Ryan helped me solve a problem. It's not the same problem that you have, but Ryan is probably the smartest guy on the planet. And Ryan always gets cranky when I say probably. But <laughs> what, what happens here is if you help everybody, what happens is they're all going to be in a position where they've created a network that is around you. And if they create a network that is around you, you're going to be the so one of the commercials that probably uh, predates most of you would be Avis. Remember the rental car company? Uh, a long time ago, their primary focus is we're happy to be number two. And most people thought that happy to be number two was being number two to Hertz. That wasn't their strategy. Their strategy was to be number two to you. So if they helped you, you think you wanted to rent a car, you didn't want to rent a car. You wanted to get to point A to point B, and they were the device that happened to get you there. And I tell a, a really great story, because you have to listen to undertones. A uh, story about a fellow that went into a hardware store to buy a one quarter inch drill. And he walked up to the fellow and said, I want a, a one quarter inch drill. What do you think the guy wanted? He wanted a hole. <laughs> he really didn't care if he got a drill. He wanted a hole. So this part of the discussion gives you the opportunity to be a little bit of a veterinarian and a little bit of a pediatrician. Because when folks, come, pardon me, folks come to you and say, this is what I'm trying to do, we fall back on the tech part of it and we forget the point. So my admonition to you is pay attention to what's going on down here. Don't lose sight of this because this is part of our life. But pay attention to what's going down here because humans haven't changed in 5,000 years. And you're empowered to help. And if you help anybody, it will always come back and lift you up. 
uh, when this PYSK came along, and it was very sweet that Michelle said, well, Tom's got all of these other nice little accolades and features on there. Um, I'm humbled by those things because those, th none of that was ever my goal. That was never anything that I had in mind. My solitary goal was to be of help to people. And regarding Savant, I can even put that in perspective. Now, keep in mind, I already said everybody on the planet works for money, but I indicated it's not the money, it's the labor. They're trying to store their labor. And uh, the problem with Wall Street and the financial world is that probably about 70 or 80 years ago, they lost their way, because those of you the students of finance remember under the Buttonwood Agreement, the companies came together and they did all this stuff to create a transaction-based environment where brokers could find people who had assets to sell and find people who wanted to buy assets and bring them together and they got a commission. But about 70 years ago, they changed. And when they changed, what they found out is that they could make more money by making their own financial products, which all by itself is not bad, with one exception. Wall Street turned itself into a professional sales organization. And the problem with professional sales organizations is professional sales organizations are always pitted against amateur buyers. And whenever you take a professional salesman and you put him up against an amateur buyer, it's going to be pretty rough on the buyer. So what happens here, Savant created a different environment uh, because, uh, I, again, my early career was with an insurance company, which I only hated for a dozen years. It took me 12 years to quit. But when I quit, what I decided I was going to do is create a company that would have been like a consulting company that was built 100 years ago. And I wanted to be in a position to attract people to me rather than have to go out and be a salesperson. I wanted to be a person where they had a reputation of this guy helped. This is something that you should be working with. Uh, once again, we got uh, one of the advisors in the office that is working with uh, a, another young woman who would normally never fall into the category of advisory client. You know, we're kind of snooty and we have high minimums and all that neat stuff depending on who you talk to. They say, well, you, we, we can't even talk to you unless you have half a million dollars. Uh, my goal in life has always been to get them to half a million dollars. <laughs> okay. If I get them to the half a million dollars, I'm creating a, a resource that I can work with. I'm helping them meet their goals. And what happens is we build up rapport and loyalty along the way. So we have the opportunity to both meet our objectives. I'm helping them get their financial autonomy goals. Even though that person can't possibly help me right now, I'm not the least bit concerned. And, the, and, and frankly, at her age and my age, it'll probably never help me. But what'll happen is she's going to be in a position of strength. And if she's in a position of strength because someone helped her, that's going to be paid back to the rest of us many, many, many times over. Okay? So let's throw it open for a few questions. And you take it wherever you want, whatever you want to know. Um, if it's really tough, I'll ask Ryan or Eric, okay? And, uh, We'll see what, what you want to know. Yes, sir? 